given the assignment of to talking about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Now, the adrenal gland is actually made up of two um, uh, layers. It has the outside layer, which we call the cortex, this yellow layer, and then the inside layer, which is this dark line, which is the medulla. The cortex makes these uh, steroids and hormones, but it's a, a medulla that makes epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And this is the, uh, line, the area in which pheochromocytomas can develop. Now, for definition, a pheochromocytoma is one of these uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine secreting tumors that arises in the adrenal medulla, in the adrenal gland. Whereas paragangliomas also produce uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, but they arise from the ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system, which can be anywhere in the body from the base of the skull uh, down to the bottom of the pelvis. And so when it's outside of the adrenal, it's called a paraganglioma. When these tumors are inside the adrenal, they're called pheochromocytomas. Now these are rare, uh, two to eight per million in the US will develop one of these tumors. And the majority of these, particularly the pheochromocytomas, are benign and are not a cancer. They are tumors that produce too much epinephrine and norepinephrine. And uh, about 10 years ago, we thought it was about 25% of these tumors were genetic. They had a, uh, you carried a gene mutation that predisposed you for developing this tumor. But now we know more and more about uh, the genetics. We've discovered more genes. And it's now estimated up to 40% of our pheos and paragangliomas that these panel, that our panelists would see are actually genetic. Now the symptoms of uh, Pheo's paragangliomas, it's also called the great masquerader because the symptoms can be episodic. They can be um, very common for and seen in a lot of other conditions. And so your family doctor and your primary care physician may not clue in to that there's something serious going on here uh, until the symptoms become much more problematic or they start to cluster. We found that most of our patients with FEOs had a delay in their diagnosis for up to a couple of years seen, and when they were seen by their family physicians and specialists, and it's because it's such a rare tumor and there's so many other reasons to have these symptoms of headache, sweating, tachycardia, racing heart or palpitations, feeling your heart pounding in your chest. A couple of clues though are patients that present with high blood pressure, very common, particularly in North America, but we're talking about high blood pressure that's difficult to control or talking about getting high blood pressure at a young age under the age of 50. Palpitations in the tachycardia coming on all of a sudden, waking up in the middle of the night. Now, how are these discovered? Well, it, they are discovered sort of three ways. One, it's, uh, it could be discovered by an incidental finding. CTs and MRI scans are very common um, uh, modalities that are done for patients that are that come into the emergency department or have been in a multiple uh, car accidents. And, and so with these CT scans, we find that 5% of these uh, incidentally discovered adrenal lesions will ultimately prove to be a pheochromocytoma. The other way they're, uh, they're discovered is on screening so that your primary care physician or your physicians taking care of you have started to think, could you be producing too much adrenaline or noradrenaline and have symptoms? And then the other way is that you are uh, uh, from a kindred, from a family that uh, is predisposed to making these tumors, so you are screened on an annual basis uh, for a functioning tumor. 
Now, a lot of patients ask, uh, you know, uh, the diagnosis, how is it made? And it's made by measuring too much of the adrenaline or noradrenaline uh, being produced over a, a period of time. And so we have two ways of doing it. One is to collect the urine for 24 hours, and the other is to do plasma metanephrines. And they're, they're both very good tests, and some places you may only be able to get plasma metanephrines or only be able to get the urinary metanephrines and the uh, uh, physician ordering them doesn't have a choice. Um, they both have their drawbacks. Um, the plasma metanephrines should be done uh, early in the morning with you laying supine for at least an hour, resting comfortably and then drawn. The urinary metanephrines, because you have to collect it over 24 hours, uh, it uh, it's, can be um, cumbersome for the patient, particularly um, if you're planning on going to a cocktail party or a party and you have to bring your jug with you to collect all of the urine. So we recommend, if you do have the choice of which one, it's really a matter of how suspicious we are about you having this syndrome, or, or sorry, syndrome, this uh, tumor. If there's a high risk, so if you have a family history of it, the symptoms are very um, uh, convincing. We want a test that has less false negatives, so a high sensitivity, and that's when we'd order the plasma metanephrines. If it's a low probability, and we're just saying it's, it's uh, an incidentally discovered mass on a CT scan, you don't have any of the symptoms, then we want something that is not going to give us a false positive. So we want uh, to have the test that has a higher specificity, and that is actually the fractionated urinary metanephrines. Once uh, we've made the diagnosis, we then want to look at these tumors, and we look at these tumors when we say anatomically, and that means using cross-sectional imaging like a CT or an MRI. And you'll find that from a surgical point of view, these tests become uh, very important. We sometimes have to repeat them uh, if they've been done in, and not in a fashion that we as surgeons can use for surgical planning, because we have many ways of, uh, of going after these tumors, um, as opposed to just the standard approach of uh, a laparotomy. And so having the, this imaging is very important. Functional imaging means using um, isotopes in which uh, are taken up by the tumors because they make the adrenaline and noradrenaline. And we have now a host of them, MIBG scans, the gallium dotatate scans, the f alpha dopa PET scans. And I think most of us would not routinely or, uh, order these. I use them when I'm worried that there may be metastatic disease, it may be multiple tumors, um, but rely mostly on the anatomical uh, imaging. Now, just to touch base, uh, uh, many of you on, uh, online probably are um, from families that carry uh, a gene abnormality. Um, and as I said, there's up to 40% are caught, um, the pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas are from a genetic abnormality. Most centers now um, will then screen, if you are diagnosed with a pheochromocytoma, you will then um, be offered and should have genetic testing to look to see if you carry a gene uh, that predisposed you to getting that tumor. And the reason is that many of these syndromes have other tumors associated with it, and we need to uh, be looking for those and to um, address those uh, to take care of you. And we're talking about things like von Hippel-Lindau or neurofibromatosis type 1. This is MEN2, which is the RET proto-oncogene. These genes here, these SDH genes, A, B, C, D, and AF2, uh, these are the genes that are causing the paragangliomas. And so um, when you have a paragangliomas, that's one of the first genes that we would look at. And they too are associated with other tumors that we need to look for. 
And we have a couple of new genes that are discovered, the MAX and the uh, TMEM. Um, and we're just learning more and more about those. So if you have a pheo or a paraganglioma, it's important to ask your physicians to make sure that you get genetic testing, not only for your own health, but for the health of your family and um, your extended family. Now the treatment of a pheochromocytoma, in my opinion, the first thing that needs to be done uh, it is going to be surgery. And the first thing that needs to be done is to put you on what we call alpha blockade. This essentially tricks the body into not responding as vigorously to the secretion of the adrenaline and noradrenaline. And the drug I like the most and have the most experience with is phenoxybenzamine. This is becoming harder to obtain in North America, um, but it's, it is a good drug. And, um, and if I can get this drug, this is the drug of choice. There are other drugs that also provide the alpha blockade, doxacin, prazosin, and they too can be utilized. They're just a little shorter acting, and, I, and maybe I'm just a slow surgeon and meticulous that I need that longer acting drug. There are alpha blockade drugs that the anesthetist can use, but what we wanna do is trick the body, put you on an alpha blockade for a, uh, for a period of time, and it can sometimes takes up to a couple of weeks, try to do it within two weeks or so, and then bring you to the operating room uh, and operate with that blockade on board. Sometimes you need to be put on a beta blocker. And again, that's part of your team that's assessing you uh, as to whether we need more medication to bring that blood pressure down to safely take you to the operating room. You go on a high salt diet to help fill up their vessels, and then it's to surgery. And this is really a team effort. This is where you do want a surgeon that is experienced with pheochromocytomas, but more importantly has a team behind him or her, the anesthetist, the endocrinologist. They all play a very vital role in caring for and uh, safely dealing with pheos and paragangliomas. So how do we take these out? Should we do an open operation um, with a big incision to get at the tumor, or can we do it with endoscopic incisions, small television cameras and small incisions? And I would say that every patient I see, there's uh, factors that have to be taken into, um, um, in, into perspective to make the decision the best way to go about taking this out. Obviously, if you can do it with smaller incisions, it's going to be a faster recovery for you as the patient, but there are patient factors and tumor factors. So just briefly, the surgeon factors, I can't stress enough that the surgeon must be experienced in these rare tumors. They should be part of this blockade team, and the surgeon should have at their, um, um, in their armamentarium, the ability to do it several different ways, from the front, from the back, laterally, with the television camera, with not the television camera, because the surgeon's gonna be making decisions and selecting the patients for the appropriate operation. The patient factors. So the body habitus of the patient may dictate for us when, how we can approach this. Is it feasible? Do, do we have the ability to do it with small incisions? Previous surgery, if we're doing it a combined procedure, if we're uh, doing it um, something else that needs an open operation, patients with coagulopathy, and then the car uh, cardiac pulmonary disease. Sometimes it, it prohibits us from actually doing it laparoscopically because the heart cannot tolerate what we call the insufflation. Finally, the tumor. So where it is, is it a pheochromocytoma? Is it a paraganglioma? What is the size of the tumor? And if we are worried that this could be malignant, 10% of pheos can be malignant. And if that's the case, I would not want to approach that with a small television camera. How it's done, whether it's done laparoscopically, which means a television camera going in through the front, 
posteriorly endoscopic, a television camera going into the back, or whether they're using a robot. These are just technical features that the surgeon will then apply for the appropriate patient, for the appropriate size of the tumor and location. One other thing before I finish is that I get a lot of questions about in the familial group I, that have pheos on both sides of their uh, both adrenal glands is can you do what we call a cortical sparing. Just take out the tumor and leave the rest of the adrenal gland, that cortex that makes other hormones that are so important. And ideally that would be helpful, but I just wanna point out that that medulla where this tumor arose from is still in here. So I approach a cortical sparing adrenal uh, adrenalectomy if there is a high likelihood that you will not have to take steroids after having both your adrenals out, it's an acceptable risk of recurrence. So you have to know as a patient that the feel may come back and that it's a low risk of malignancy. And uh, this, this, the um, data would say that even if in the best of hands, about up to 15% of patients, even though they had a cortical sparing, will still need steroids and that the risk of it coming back is gonna be close to 40%. So in summary, these are rare tumors and although they're benign, they are life-threatening. And uh, they can occur within or outside the adrenal gland. Surgery is the treatment of choice but it requires advanced surgical expertise. And I believe you need to have alpha blockade before surgery, and you should always have genetic testing sometime in the course of your treatment. And I'll end on that so that we can answer some more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasika, for that excellent presentation. We'll move on to our question and answer session on pheochromocytoma and paraginglioma. Um, so our first question will be about paraginglioma. Uh, so you mentioned paraginglioma as being a pheochromocytoma outside of the adrenal gland. The question is on um, head and neck paragangliomas or a three centimeter skull based paraginglioma. In some cases, we consider them to be inoperable, presumably due to, uh, we're concerned that there may be nerves damaged uh, if we were to operate uh, on that patient. Um, when do you uh, recommend surgery for these uh, head and neck paragangliomas? And what are the other treatment options if surgery is not recommended? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, so the uh, paragangliomas that occur in the head and neck are an interesting group because most of them arise from the parasympathetic. So they actually do not have the function that, of the ones that I had talked about producing adrenaline and noradrenaline. So they tend to be non-functional. Uh, but they can um, encase the uh, vessels in the uh, neck and at the base of the skull. So we do want to take them out when they are diagnosed. And in these, a lot of times um, it requires uh, the skill not just of a endocrine surgeon, but you may need the skill of a neurosurgeon to get to the base of the skull or a vascular surgeon. Um, if they are considered inoperable because you can't take it out without disrupting the blood flow that goes to the brain, then um, embolization has been helpful at shrinking these down. Um, and we've had some success of embolizing uh, ones that were questionable and operable, they got smaller, and then we could go back and do the operation. Okay, great. I'll ask the other panelists, um, are there, uh, in what institutions are you using external beam radiation as an alternative to surgery for these head and neck perigangliomas? Is there anybody else that wants to address that question? Well, I've seen, I saw a patient just yesterday who had had a carotid body tumor removed that required resection of his uh, carotid artery and and it had involved nodes and he got radiation therapy. So they used that as an adjuvant um, 
And I guess in some inoperable cases, people might treat it that way as well. Okay, okay, great. Um, now, Dr. Pasika, you mentioned the role of cortical sparing adrenalectomy for some patients who have uh, hereditary conditions. Um, can you talk a little bit more specifically about, do you have certain size criteria or what are your more specific indications when you would consider cortical sparing? So the cortical sparing, the concept is because you have to take out both adrenals. If you only have to take out one adrenal, your other adrenal will be able to uh, produce the uh, hormones, uh, the steroids, the, um, and you do not need to take excess steroids. So if I have to do a bilateral adrenalectomy, I'm looking for the ideal situation in which the tumor is sort of uh, hanging off the adrenal gland so that I can cut the tumor with a good margin and leave a uh, vascular, vascularized adrenal. Sometimes these adrenal pheo, uh, pheos are so big uh, that you can't even see the cortex because it's growing and push the cortex cells outside of it. And that's not a good one to leave behind or do a cortical sparing because you run the risk of cutting into the feel. So I'd have to be able to get it without cutting into the feel and getting a good margin and leaving an adequate vascular amount of adrenal behind. Okay, great. Um, now the next question is about malignant pheochromocytoma. You mentioned mm -hmm. about 10% of cases um, might be malignant. Uh, what are the treatment options for a malignant pheochromocytoma that has dis distant spread? Um, maybe Dr. Premier, do you want to address that question? Sure. Um, so we can uh, operate if there are limited sites of disease that can be all removed. Um, that's, in my experience, isn't a typical uh, finding in patients with distant metastatic disease very often. Um, but there is a new treatment out, and that is using MIBG, which stands for meta iodal benzyl guanidine, which is why we prefer to call it MIBG. But uh, that is a radioactive isotope. It's a lot like PRRT for other neuroendocrine tumors, in that it's uh, you first get an, a, a, an MIBG scan to prove that the tumors take up this compound on an imaging scan. And if they do, they get the, the dosage for a for two therapeutic doses from that. And the patient uh, gets an infusion of the radioactive MIBG, the cells take it up, the radiation is emitted for a short distance and uh, treats the tumor. So that became uh, FDA approved last year. Uh, we were one of the first sites in the United States to open and have it available. So we've been getting patients from many other states that have been coming here with metastatic uh, pheos and paragangliomas. Uh, to get the treatment. Can you tell us a little bit about your success rate or the results of that? Well, the trial was was a positive trial, um, so we know that it's a it's successful treatment. Uh, in terms of our own individual results, uh, we uh, uh, have only finished a couple patients, so we don't yet know our long-term results for us as an individual institution. Okay. And if okay, I can great. add... One thing to that um, is that is that there is actually um, some research going on in some trials, and I think actually there's one at the like National Institutes of Health regarding PRT for metastatic uh, pheochromocytoma and metastatic paraganglioma. So that's different than the MIBG, but the same principle. Since these tumors are neuroendocrine tumors, a lot of them express somatostatin receptors. So patients would get a 68-gallon dotated PET-CT scan, and if they, uh, their tumors do light up, they would potentially be a candidate for PRT. So like we use this therapy for um, other neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we could also potentially use it for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, um, but we need uh, more studies and a little bit more time to figure out uh, how well this is going to work but that's another potential therapy that's gonna be available in the future, including other or next generation PRT treatments, which are going to be coming out over the next few years. So I think plenty of therapy options will hopefully uh, be um, on the market within the next few years. Yeah, so that's very exciting. Um, Dr. Pasika, the next question um, for you is, you know, we have patients who um, I think we've all seen in clinic 
who have these symptoms that seem to be really um, sort of consistent with a pheochromocytoma, um, and they've been evaluated for this, and they have the blood pressure spike, that would indicate a pheochromocytoma, but the hormonal testing is normal, including 24-hour urine testing. So could, could it be that you have a pheochromocytoma if your urine or blood testing is completely normal? Um, well, that's interesting. I, I guess uh, if I have a real high index of suspicion, and the urine tests are normal, that's when we would get plasma metanephrines and do it in a, a, a different way. Um, you know, uh, functional imaging like MIBG and gallium um, dotatate are not diagnostic, so you don't want to go down the route of doing a, um, a uh, functional test as a diagnostic scan. So. Um, I, I'm not sure what I think uh, definitely this is where my endocrinologist uh, and we have a, a hypertensive endocrinology team. I mean, they would be very much involved. You could do other tests. There's a clonidine um, uh, uh, suppression test, but um, kind of beyond uh, um, my understanding, if I thought it was that, um, and everything came back negative, I definitely just refer them to an endocrinologist with some help. Yeah, I, I think know. that's a really important point that you mentioned, really relying on the, the biochemical testing rather than the imaging testing for the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. Um, the next question, you know, you, you touched on, um, again, that about maybe 10% of cases are malignant, and you talked about some of the hereditary conditions um, it, can we have a little bit more discussion on in which cases we suspect a malignant pheochromocytoma and the association between SDHB mutations and pheochromocytoma? Um, so, uh, absolutely. So, uh, when we have an exceedingly large um, pheochromocytoma in size, so you start getting over 10 centimeters in size, a, um, a tumor that is producing dopamine, which is also part of the making of adrenaline and noradrenaline. Uh, if you saw any evidence of other lesions in the, the chest um, or in the lymph nodes surrounding uh, the tumor, these would be all things that I would be quite worried that these, this is a malignancy and would get functional imaging to see if uh, these other tumors light up. I think you were uh, mentioned the SDHB mutation. This is a paraganglioma. Uh, it occurs usually in the abdomen, but what we are learning is that it tends to be, um, have a higher incidence of being malignant or locally invasive when we go to take it out. So with that mutation, um, again, I would be surveying the patient before operating on a single lesion, looking for other areas of metastases. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much.